Hello, uh, my name is Sean McLean, and today we're going to investigate a little bit about how biology deals with energy and harvest is, harvests energy across membranes. So to begin with, we have to remember um, a little bit about chemistry and ask why do chemical reactions occur in the first place? And chemical reactions occur when there are energy differences between molecules on one side of an equation to another side of an equation. So here, what I've drawn out um, is a possible chemical reaction between A and going to B. And there is a place where energy is minimized. And that place we refer to as the equilibrium. It's in the middle point uh, where there's this well um, that's observed. And to both sides of that well, we could imagine going uphill in both directions. And we'd eventually approach pure A or pure B. And the lowest energy point will be at some mixture or concentration that minimizes the energy. So concentrations adjust themselves through chemical reactions to minimize energy differences. Now, let's think about that in a slightly different way um, and think about it in terms of a uh, roughly a per molecule basis. And so we'll draw an axis here on the vertical axis of total molar uh, free energy. And when we say free energy, we're talking about the amount of energy that's available to do work um, in a system. And um, we'll usually talk about that um, using uh, the word Gibbs energy, and that's named after uh, 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 Mr. Gibbs, Professor Gibbs. And uh, this uh, formulation refers to cases that occur at constant uh, temperature and pressure. And so again, let's imagine a simple chemical reaction. Here we've got A plus B goes to C plus D. And if we start out with some concentration of A and B and C and D, um, we can imagine the case where there's more energy on the A plus B side of the equation. And that is shown here in this histogram that shows some amount of energy um, associated with the reactants. The products are associated with a lower amount of energy. And uh, this energy difference uh, means that a chemical reaction between A and B to form C and D could happen. And that would happen in a way that would equalize the energies uh, between the reactants and the products. And that's shown on um, the right hand side there. Um, the change in energy, um, if we think about the amount of energy that's available to do work, again, we refer to as the Gibbs energy. And we can denote that with this delta G symbol that I've written here. And it's the change in the reaction energy as we approach equilibrium. It's the maximum amount of energy that we can use to do work in the system. So this delta G value is going to be very, very useful for us to describe many processes. We can predict if a reaction will go forward in the left to right hand side of the uh, equation. Um, and that would be uh, associated with Gibbs energies of negative values. So here I say uh, uh, this value Gibbs delta G is equal to negative when there's more energy associated with the reactants than the products. If we get to a place that the delta G is equal to zero, it means there's no reaction to take place. Or we're at equilibrium. Or another way to think about it is that the forward and reverse reactions happen at an equal rate. If we keep going um, uh, from one side of the chemical equation to another through that delta G equals zero location, we can pile up more um, energy on the product side of the equation. And here it would be uh, not spontaneous to go in the left to right direction, but instead it would be spontaneous to go from the right to the left or a reverse reaction. So now that we have a very basic grasp that uh, chemical uh, reactions happen because of energy differences between molecules, we can explore the, this idea that biology utilizes again and again of coupling one reaction to another. And this is a type of energy sharing. And this is a, a way that energy flows through biological systems. So let's check out this reaction here that I've drawn from x going to y. And I've said that the energy um, of x going to y uh, it's higher, the, uh, so it means that the reaction would have a delta G of positive value. The reaction does not occur. However, let's imagine um, we have a second reaction that we could add into the system. A goes to B. And if A going to B is downhill and releases some amount of energy, we can imagine coupling A going to B to X going to Y. So this is a way of uh, kind of gearing or transferring one type of ener one energy of reaction to another. Um, and the overall process would now become favorable. And so we could think about this summed reaction that I've written on the bottom. X plus A goes to Y plus B. Now let's think about this, how it could work in a biological system. 
there are many ways that this can work in the biological system, but today we're going to focus on uh, charge separation across the membrane. And this is going to get us back to our title slide of energy harvesting across membranes. So in general, uh, cells that we find on the Earth today, they can be thought of as taking negative charge and putting it inside of their cell, and or taking positive charge and um, forcing it outside of their uh, membrane. This could be different, and I encourage you to think about um, other types of life that might exist and run these processes in reverse, or go online and try to find an organism that does that. There might be one there. But let's explore this, how, the, how this might work. I've drawn a tiny little bacterium here. It's around 100 nanometers um, across, so how big is that? Remember that one of your hairs is probably around 100 microns, so we're much smaller than you can see with your eye, um, or one micron. Um, and this uh, bacterium, if we zoom in on the membrane, the line that defines the boundary of the bacterium in my drawing, we would find um, a membrane bilayer made out of phospholipids. And I've drawn in here this cartoon diagram that's a cloud of protein. And um, let's say that there is a possible chemical reaction that this protein um, facilitates or catalyzes. And that the reaction energy is negative, so it's a favorable reaction, x going to y. A negative reaction energy means that there is some amount of work that can be done in the system. What biology does, or one thing that biology does with this type of reaction energy, is it, again, it couples one type of reaction to another. And in this case, x going to y is being coupled with the movement of a proton from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. It's a way of coupling one type of reaction to another. Now, if we do that many, many times, many x's are transformed into y's, this protein can uh, facilitate the transfer of protons again and again from the inside to the outside. And that results in the buildup of a charge imbalance across the membrane. And all of these protons that are on the outside of the membrane can later on be used to force processes that are otherwise not feasible um, by coupling the energy associated with the proton movement going to the inside of the cell to push a reaction forward. And so I've drawn that here in the form of A going to B. A going to B might be associated with a positive Gibbs free energy. That means it's not spontaneous. However, if we add the energy that is released when a proton comes into the cell, there's a chance that the protein might be able to make use of that energy and add it together. And so, again, we could think in terms of a net reaction. We're really taking x plus a goes to y plus b, and we're using the energy that's released as x goes to y through uh, this membrane-bound uh, movement of protons to couple these reactions together. So let's look at some specific examples of how biology actually does this. One example um, that we could look at right off the bat is the case of coupling one form of energy to another. And that's what all of these examples will be of, is coupling one uh, type of energy to another. And in this case, I've drawn uh, light energy um, interacting with a protein complex. And this protein is actually pumping ions, protons in this case, from the inside to the outside of the membrane. This is called bacteriorhodopsin. It's a way that organisms can take light energy, transfer protons across the membrane, and later on couple the uh, disequilibrium in protons from the inside to the outside to other chemical processes in the cell. There are other examples of moving protons or charges across the membrane that don't involve light. In fact, probably uh, most in, uh, that you might see around you, other than that you find in plants, um, are going to be uh, working this way. All of the pumps that are involved in your body and your metabolism are working this way. These pumps are called electrogenic pumps. So these electrogenic pumps, um, we can see they take electrons. Here, x is associated with one pair of electrons, or two electrons. And we can imagine electrons flowing from x onto a and work uh, being done in the process, or energy released in the process. And as that energy is released, protons are again pumped across the, the, pro uh, the membrane. Another class of electrogenic pumps will take electrons again, but this time the electrons will go into the membrane. And so the electron acceptor here, A, could be inside the cell, in the membrane, or outside of the cell. There's a wide variety of places that the uh, electrons can go. The mechanism here would be the same. Taking the energy that's available when electrons move from a donor to an acceptor and coupling the energy released to the movement of a proton across the membrane. 
Another variety of uh, charge separating that we see in biology is called the redox loop. This is a case that doesn't involve a pump per se, but instead it involves the movement of electrons in and the movement of protons out. So what I've drawn here are two different proteins, and this two different proteins is key for this mechanism to occur. The protein that's associated with the acquisition of electrons from X, shown in this diagram, is moving those electrons onto this molecule A, and A circles around in the membrane. A goes to AH2, and AH2 interacts with another protein. That other protein releases these protons on the outside of the cell. So that, and as that happens, those electrons that were originally from X find themselves on Y. So to follow the protons, first we start with protons on the inside. Electrons move from X. Those protons find themselves in the inside of the membrane. Now they're associated with this A molecule. Finally, the protons find themselves on the outside. The protons went from the inside out, but the electrons went from the outside in. So this is an example of a redox loop. It's not a pump. It's a way of uh, looping one molecule around and around to result in charge separation across the membrane. A very simple way to develop a charge imbalance across the membrane involves proton consumption inside of the cell. Here I've drawn a molecule of X with two electrons associated with it. And this cloud molecule that I've drawn, this protein, um, is associated with the acquisition of those electrons and the sending of those electrons to a separate protein. That separate protein then delivers those electrons again onto this molecule A. This time the molecule A is inside of the cell. And when electrons move on to A, protons become associated with it. So the delivery of electrons onto A actually consumes protons. We don't need to think about any pumps. We don't need to think about any of this looping. It's a simple movement of charge to the inside of the cell. It's associated with the consumption of proton, protons on the inside. There are many ways that uh, biology can move charge across the membrane. And today we've only talked about a few of them. It's important to remember how modular these things are. And oftentimes in biology you will find pieces of one pump mixed with a piece of another pump and then um, next to a redox loop. Biology has explored this for billions of years. So part of what's fun to think about is how many different reactions can be coupled to different ways of moving charge across the membrane. We've only looked at a couple of them today to try to learn about the broad classification of these systems. After all of this pumping occurs, in general, we can imagine um, doing work with the buildup of charge across the membrane. So the most famous example that you might have heard of is the ATPase, which again is an example of coupling one um, not favorable reaction to another. Here we take ADP and we use the energy that's released as protons come into the cell and we couple the movement of those protons to forming ATP. There are, again, however, are many, many other processes that could be coupled to this generation of proton uh, difference across the membrane. Were any of these complexes important for the origin of life? It's a great question and nobody really knows so far. Some of them seem rather complicated. What I've drawn as clouds today that are involved in these proton pumping reactions are actually very complicated multimeric protein machines. They're very complicated. They're difficult to understand even for us doing research on them today. Maybe they were too complicated for the origin of life. Or maybe the origin of life required the formation of these complex machines. Which type would have been involved in the formation of life? It's an open question. We have to ask ourselves along um, with that question, uh, was, were the first forms of life actually cellular, or could they have been acellular? If the first forms of life were not cellular, then all of this talk about membrane uh, bioenergetics becomes very difficult to imagine. Maybe there were other ways of coupling one chemical reaction to another. If they did have a membrane, what type would it be? And again, which type of pump, or loop, or proton consumption pathway, or light absorbing pathway would have been used? 